So today, we're going to continue in the book of Exodus as we've been going through the journey of the book of Exodus. We come to, to chapter 20. We were there last week, and, and we were uh, kind of looking at just the first two verses last week as we were looking at the foundation that precluded everything about the law that you have to understand if you're truly and completely going to grasp the real idea behind the commandments. So today, I want to begin by just asking you, uh, anybody here been on 985? Okay, now, I want to see just how many of you are honest today. How many of you have been on 985 and driven faster than 70 miles per hour? All right, I see some of you being honest. Some, some of you are nodding your head, so it's not so obvious that you've done that. You know, there is, a, there is a law out there, there is a boundary that says the speed limit on 985 is 70 miles per hour. Right here on Atlanta Highway, anybody know how fast the speed limit is here? 45. How many of you drove 50 coming to church this morning? All right, I like some confession early this morning uh, as we're getting into God's Word. You know, those are boundaries that are set up, and we usually will follow those boundaries uh, for a couple of reasons. One of them is they're there to keep us from getting hurt, because if somebody was out here driving 85 miles per hour down uh, Atlanta Highway, somebody's going to get hurt, right? We follow them to keep us from getting hurt, or we follow them, come on, let's be honest, because we don't want to get caught. Amen? We just don't want to get caught and get a ticket, right? So those are two reasons why those laws, that we will follow those laws. Well, when it comes to the Ten Commandments, they are something that bring some boundaries that God set forth for us to look at and to follow and to really take into account. But here's one of the things I want us to think about is over in Matthew chapter 22, someone comes up to Jesus and says, Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? Now, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus had 613 laws that he could have chosen. 613 things that he could have said is the greatest commandment, is the greatest law. But Jesus says this. First, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And then he offers an answer that they need, uh, for a question they didn't even ask. He said, and the second is like it. To love your neighbor as yourself. And all of the commandments, they were summed up in those two things of love God and love others. So when Jesus said that, what does that do to the Ten Commandments? Does it wipe it out? Does it mean that the Ten Commandments does not have the same standard or quality? Or maybe God made a mistake by giving all the law and, and Jesus had to fix it. Well, those are great questions we're going to look at. Because it's important for us to understand what these commandments are, and see some hope that is given even in the heart of these commandments and laws that God gave in Exodus chapter 20. The law is divided into three categories. As we look at the 613 laws in the Old Testament, they're divided into three categories. There's moral, there's civil, and then there's ceremonial. Moral, civil, and ceremonial laws. And as those are divided up, we find that the Ten Commandments is the most recognized and most well-known. We actually, if you walk into our office across the street, you're going to see over the, the fireplace in the front office is a great, big, huge copy of the Ten Commandments. I would say they are still important, but we have to understand how do they fit into our lives on this side of the cross of Jesus Christ. I mean, after all, you've probably heard people say, well, the Ten Commandments say, how many people in here is going to be honest this morning? i just be, be flat out honest. How many of you know all Ten Commandments by heart? I saw one, two hands. Good, good, good. Uh, three hands, all right. How many of you know five of the Ten Commandments? Okay, I see a few more hands. So which five are you forgetting and not really paying attention to? Oh, you weren't expecting that, were you? <laughs> so these Ten Commandments, they're important, but yet we don't remember all of them. Most of us don't. But each and every one of them speaks into our life and will tell us something about, number one, who God is. Because last week I talked about how these commandments, one of the purposes is revelation. 
It reveals God's character and God's nature and something about God and something about us that we need to know. That's why the Ten Commandments are so important. Are we required to follow the Ten Commandments? I mean, are we required to follow all Ten Commandments? All those who say yes, raise your hand, and then I want to ask you a question. What were you doing yesterday on the Sabbath? Because Saturday is actually the Sabbath. And the Ten Commandments say, says to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. So if we want to talk about keeping the Ten Commandments, uh, you better have done a good job of keeping yesterday holy and resting. So what do we do with the Ten Commandments? How do we interact with these things? How do they apply to our lives? Romans 10, 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes, everyone who has faith. Jesus fulfilled all the law and gave that gift to you. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, I did not come to destroy or do away with or negate the law. Jesus said he didn't come to just take the Old Testament and throw it out the window. Jesus said, I have come to take the law and to fulfill it. And once he fulfilled it, you know what he did? He gave it to you as a gift being fulfilled. Because the law was there for a purpose and a reason. And Jesus did not simply come to de destroy it, but to fulfill it. And we cannot understand grace if we ignore the Old Testament. If we don't look at the law, if we don't look at the commandments, we cannot get a full picture of the New Testament. As a matter of fact, I look at it like this. Any of you that wear glasses right now and you put on a mask and then you begin to talk or you begin to breathe, you know what happens? Your glasses get all fogged up. If you try to simply look at the cross and Jesus without the law, without the commandments, without the Old Testament, you will only see it through fogged up glasses. If you want to see it clearly, you better take all of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation. Because the story is clear. It's about Jesus. And these commandments are about Jesus and points to the good news that we have that we can celebrate today. This we find in chapter 20 reveals two things about a relationship. It talks about a vertical relationship which we're going to dive in today and it talks about a horizontal relationship which we'll dive in next week. As we look at the Ten Commandments, they are divided in those ways. Love God, love others. So let's take those in chunks today and kind of flesh them out and figure out what they're telling us. These commandments help us understand the holiness of God. These commandments help us understand the character of God and the simpleness of man and our dire need for God. Let's just, let's just read 1 through 11. Read with me, beginning in verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water underneath the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing loving kindness to thousands. To those who love me and keep my commandments. Verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male, your female servant, or your cattle, or your, your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath, and He made it holy. As we look at this, 
we begin to get a picture of our God, of His work, our faults, and our needs. Because as we lean into this chapter 20 of these commandments, we must understand the foundation that was laid is we have to remember who these commandments are from and what He did. Who are they from? How many of you remember from last week? Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh, the formal name of God, the name given to Moses when this whole journey began. Yahweh, the one and only true God. It's not God in general. It is Yahweh. It is the only true God. And then there is Elohim, which is plural and singular. We must remember where these commandments are coming from and not only who's given them to us, but what did he do? See, he says he delivered them from the house of slavery. Let me tell you something today. There is a deliverer from the house of slavery that has left heaven and come to earth so that you can be set free and redeemed, and his name is Jesus. And he has commands for us, and he said to love God and to love others. But let's really just lean into this loving God because I want us to look at the vertical relationship today I want us to look at the vertical relationship because God gave the Ten Commandments in response of who He was and what He had done. Let's lean into this vertical commandments, the vertical commandments, the vertical relationship. And the first thing we see here is God makes it very clear. We are to love God. Somebody say, love God. Come on, say it like you mean it. Love God. Because God makes it very clear up front. This is who I am. This is what I've done. Now here's the first and and foremost. Verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. God is not saying, hey, I'll share your space a little bit. God is saying there is no space to share. God is saying second place is not an option in your life for him. Is God so, so, so dogmatic and mean that he's saying... I have to be it. What God is saying is He wants a relationship with you so bad. He he wants you faithful and single-minded. God and God alone. God alone is what He is saying in the first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. He is addressing who we should worship. Whom is it that we worship today? When you came into this place and this team was up here praising God and singing about a beautiful name and holy ground and all those things, who were you worshiping today? Were your thoughts on on God or were your thoughts on maybe what you're going to have for lunch today? I'm sorry if I'm stepping on some toes today, but here's the seriousness of the situation. We cannot treat God as a second-class citizen in our life and expect Him to move and do something great in our homes and in our families and in our communities. Until God is preeminent in our life, God will continue to allow things to be wrecked in our life until we fall on our knees and our face before Him and say, God, you and you alone do I worship. No other, no one else, you alone. And when we're there, then God's going to start working. See, God was not laying out these commandments because he's going to be dogmatic and start hitting people over the head. He was laying them out so that he could have interaction and relationship and work in their life and do something powerful and great. So he begins, number one, do not have any other gods beside me. Let me ask you a question. Since I've been stepping on your toes, I'm going to go ahead and do it. What gods do you have in your life? What gods do you have in your life? How many of you could not go a week without this thing right here? If you cannot go without this, but you can go without God, you need to get on your knees and repent because that's a God in your life. God says there's no room for no other gods. There isn't another place. For another God to sit. The throne in your heart is designed for one God to sit in it. There is no room for another one. It don't fit. He begins with the first commandment of who you should worship. And he says, you shall have no other gods before me. Second, he says in verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol. You should not make an idol 
of anything in heaven above, on earth beneath, or in the waters below. Do not make an idol out of anything that is on this earth. You know what he's saying? Don't make an idol out of anything that's been created. We have to be careful, mom and dads, not to make our children into idols in our life. We have to be careful not to make our boyfriend or girlfriend an idol in our life. Or our fiancé, or our spouse, or our job, or our bank account. Let me tell you something. An idol does not have to look like Buddha sitting on your shelf at home. An idol can look like the person that stares back at you in the mirror every morning. So we must be very careful not to make idols of created things because that worship of that is futile and has no power. So see, he talked about who we should worship, and then he talks about how we should worship. The Ten Commandments begins with the idea of worshiping God. When we come to the Ten Commandments, we don't need to just see it as a list of do's and don'ts. Have you ever noticed how most of them say, do not do this and do not do that? And as soon as you tell a kid, do not get a cookie, you know what that kid wants? He wants cookie. Whenever the posted speed limit is 70 miles per hour, you know what we want to do? Yeah, I can go 75. Tal's not going to pull me over. <laughs> They'll allow me five miles per hour. They'll allow me two or three miles. I can go over just a little bit. And if that was not even there, you may not even drive 70. But because that limit's there, you go, yeah, you know what? I can push it. I can get there a little bit faster. Yeah, like 12 seconds faster if you drove 75. But the law isn't simply there to give us do's and don'ts. It is to point us to the God of verse 2 when he says, Have no other gods before me and do not have any idols in your life. And if you want to take that serious, look how much space he gives to this idea. Verses 4, 5, and 6. Hopefully in your scriptures, if you, as you've got them open, you can see this. Verse 5, you shall not worship them or serve them. The how of worship. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, who Yahweh, your Elohim, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who, what does your Bible say? Those who what? Hate me. Anybody here hate God? Anybody's kids here hate God? Well, let me, let me give you a definition of what hate is according to God here in, in Exodus 20. And then we're going to talk about Jesus. Verse 6. But showing loving kindness or mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Who has said that? Who in the world in the Bible said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments? His name is Jesus. John, in the book of John, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Those who love me will keep my commandments. So let me tell you today, the commandments are not nostalgia. They're not to be hung on a wall. They're to be lived out in our life. Not because they're a list of do's and don'ts, but because we love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we worship Him alone, and we have no other idols. Thus, and therefore, we shall follow the Ten Commandments, or the, the commandments that God leads us to, the commandments that God convicts us to follow. When we look at the Ten Commandments, it isn't simply a rule, a list of rules of do's and don'ts. Because Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 once again says, You have heard it was said, you shall not commit murder. But I say to you, to the one who hates his brother or says, You, you fool, have already committed murder. For the man who looks at a woman and turns and looks again, has already committed adultery in his heart. 
See, when we only look at the, the level one, the very minimum standard of you shall not commit adultery or you shall not kill or you should not have an idol, we can very easily on the outward make a, a facade, a camouflage that we're all right, we're good. We're showing up at church. We're reading our Bible. We're good. But down deep inside, we're rotten rascals. When a woman walks by, we go, Hey, baby. And in our heart, we have already committed adultery. God's standard here was the minimum requirement to have a fulfilled life and a relationship with God and be able to commune with Him. And Jesus comes along and says, let me take that minimum and let me explain it to you. Let me flesh this out. You have heard it was said, but I say to you, what Jesus is saying, the attitude matters. Not just the letter of the law. Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. Galatians chapter 3 verse 19. says, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions. See, transgressions are revealed because of the law, but the law was given because transgressions already existed. Can I tell you what you could call the people who lived before the law was given? Sinners. The people who were alive when Abraham were around, you know what they were? Transgressors. They made mistakes they sinned. The law was simply given so that we could see more clearly exactly who we are. You know, oftentimes we'll, uh, I'll get out of my car and I'll be looking in the window of the car next to me yesterday. Um, I believe it was yesterday or Friday. My son and I, we went up to Academy Sports and I got out of my Jeep and I stood there and I put my mask on looking at the window of a van that was parked right next to us. It was a dark window. It was a great mirror for me to look at. And then Buddy says something that I didn't think about. Dad, what if somebody's in there, they're looking at you thinking you're weird, <laughs> staring at them in the van. See, I didn't look clearly all the way through to understand. All I saw was just a surface and didn't see that really good. But the law was given because sin already existed. The law just says, let me make it a little clearer for you that you have a great need, that you've made mistakes. The law was never intended to be a standard to get you into heaven. Never. Listen, I want to say that again because many of us grow up thinking, if I keep the Ten Commandments, you, you hear people say, you hear people say, well, when you die, will you go to heaven? Well, I've been pretty good. I've kept most of the Ten Commandments. I've, I've been good. The Ten Commandments don't get you into heaven. Jesus does. Jesus is the only way. The Ten Commandments are not there to give you a standard to get into heaven because i got news for you. We've all already messed it up. Not a one of us had to be taught how to lie when we were a kid. But we could figure out real quick to protect my behind. I can say a little... Say it in a different way, and I won't get in trouble. You know what you did? You lied. Let's just call it what it is. It was a lie. I've done that. I can't go back and change it. But thanks be to the grace of God that when that is revealed to me, His grace will cover it up, and I can have a relationship with God Almighty. Second thing, not only are we to love God, but we are to honor God. God. We are to honor Him. How important is a name? How many of you in here would, would just love it if I walked up to you and called you by, by the wrong name? Anybody here would just go, man, I have such a loving pastor. He is so great. He calls me by a different name every single week. You would begin to feel like, well, he don't even care about me. He don't know what. He calls me a different name every single week. I ain't going back to church there. Names are important. They matter. That's why when you're out shopping or you're somewhere and you take a glance at that name tag and you call them by name, boom, 
That person just had value because you called them by their name. Their name is important. Look at what God said about his name. Verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. I've already been stepping on some toes. Can I just go ahead and grind it a little bit this morning? This isn't just simply talking about the one we know that starts with God and ends with a D word. If you use Jesus and you're not praying to him or talking about him, this comes into play in your life. So if you use Jesus as a slang word when something happens, listen, God said, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Ooh. Hey, I didn't write it. I'm just here delivering the letter, guys. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, See, that relationship of love is built on that idea of honor and respect and following what God has asked. Do not take his name in vain. In Hebrew, this word carries the idea of do not carry it. So I'm going to go a little bit farther. Do not carry it in vain. I am carrying this Bible this morning. Look at this. I'm carrying it. I got it in my hand. I'm carrying it around with me. Wherever I go, you can see I have a Bible in my hand. What if I never read it, could really care less about what it said, and live my life however I wanted and still carried it around? What would you say? You'd ask, why are you carrying that Bible? Because it's making no difference in your life. Why is it that we're living our life carrying God's name in vain each and every day as we go to work or we go to school or we go to shop or we're on the phone with someone or we're dealing with family? Why is it that we take God's name and we go, "Yeah, hold on just a second, God. Well, let me tell you what I think about you. And then we'll go, all right, I got my Bible back. We must be careful. God's name, we carry his name. If you are a Christian, that word carries with it Christ-like. That's what that means. That's not something I made up. It's from Scripture. When they called them Christians, they called them little Christ, little Jesuses. And if you're a little Jesus, you better carry his name well. There's a running joke around here, and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you all because I just think it's funny. I tell people, if you're out at a restaurant or you're out somewhere in public and you do something really ugly or, or, or bad, I want you to look at them and say, I'm from Free Chapel. <laughs> but if you do something really nice and good, say, I'm from Chicopee. That's just a running joke. That's, I'm, I'm not serious about that because what I want you to do is when you're out there, act like you know Jesus. Don't attach a church to it. Jesus is the one that will make a difference. Whether you're at Free Chapel, Chicopee, Christ Place, it doesn't matter what church you go to. If you don't have Jesus and you don't live like Jesus, then you need Jesus because this world will not change until it happens. So God himself, we need to honor him in the way we carry his name, in the way we use his name. If we want blessings from God, we need to speak blessings of God and use his name in a blessed way. So let's go on. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Now what in the world does that mean to us? How does that apply to us? Because yesterday was the Sabbath. Today is Sunday. It's the first day of the week. I hate to disappoint some of you, but today's day number one. Yesterday was day number seven. Today's day number one of a week. It's, it's the beginning of a new week. Why do we worship on Sunday? Start our week off right. Number one, first day of the week, we need to be worshiping God. Number two, when Jesus rose and he went up into heaven, when Jesus rose from the grave, you know what day it was? First day of the week. When he arose and and he ascended back up into heaven, you know what day it was? First day of the week. Whenever the Christians would get together and they needed a place to worship and, and they would actually use the synagogue where the Jews worshiped, You know what day the synagogue was empty? The first day of the week. It was full on the 7th. 
So the first day of the week was established as a day to worship and honor Christ. But regardless of what you see about this, because there's scriptures that, that say that, you know, don't judge someone by the way that they see holy days and, and don't look down on them, those who think yesterday's the day to keep holy and those who think today's the day to keep holy. Don't look down on them. That's not the, that's not the attitude. That's not the intent of that law. The intent is this. Who do you trust? Do you trust God or do you trust yourself? It says six days you should work and on the Sabbath you shall rest. Why? Well, one, we, need, we all need to rest. I mean, we all need a break. Uh, we could do a real practical illustration right now of resting on the Sabbath and we could all just lay down in our chairs and take a nap. I think that would be the best scripture illustration ever. Right there, just, just take a nap right now and rest. Because we live in a culture that's busier than ever. But we get so caught up in us providing and doing, we miss that God's already done it. That if we will just stop, say, you know what? Yeah, that needs to be done, but I'm going to get over it. It'll get done some other time. And trust God to Provide. See, these first four commandments are about one person and one person only, and that is God Himself. The vertical commandments, the vertical God. But why is this law important? Why is it important? It's because of Galatians 3.24. Galatians 3.24 makes it very clear why we have the law, because in Galatians, it lets us know, Paul does, the law has become our tutor. It has become our guide. I'd use the word our revealer. Of what? Well, he says, so that we may be justified by faith through Jesus Christ. It reveals to us our need for Jesus. It reveals to us a God who loves us, who wants to be present in our life, a God who wants to interact with us and to bless us, a God who wants to be near us, and that we ourselves need Jesus to make it happen. There has been only one man ever lived who's ever fulfilled all 613 laws. That was Jesus. He never sinned according to the scriptures. See, why is the law important? The law is designed to reveal our need for a redeemer. We all need to be redeemed by Jesus Christ. These commandments are the minimum standard of righteousness. The maximum standard is as Jesus revealed it. Our attitudes, our thoughts, that inward stuff that nobody sees. And the only way to achieve that is through the Holy Spirit. The purpose of the Ten Commandments is not to get us to heaven, but to get us near Christ. To get us to a place where we desire Him more than anything. Today, as we come to this scripture where do you stand Gina if you'll go ahead and start making your way this way because I want to hit on what must I do just for just for a moment because this is important it comes straight from these verses what we must do with these Ten Commandments is we need to improve our worship of God in our life we need to improve the worship of God in our life. Verses 3 and 6 makes that very clear. It talks about who we worship and how we worship. We need to improve the worship of God in our life. He must be priority. He must be preeminent. He is the who and He is the how. So we must improve our worship. And second, we need to purify our words, and our responses to God. 
God's word is not to be measured by cultural relevance. I'm going to say that again because there's going to be some people, if they quoted me on Facebook, I'd get all kinds of flack for that, but I'm going to say it again. God's word is not to be measured by cultural relevance or emotions or feelings or what fits your situation so you can come out better. God's word is God's word and what it says, it says. And it's there. And that's what we must stand on. And so when God reveals something to us, we must respond. We must respond in purity with our actions and our words. Where are you today when it comes to your relationship with God? Has the Holy Spirit, has He he dealt with you today to reveal some things that you need to bring before the Lord and say, God, here's an area of my life. I don't have you as preeminent. I'm not worshiping you and you alone. I have allowed other gods to come into my life. Or maybe, Lord, you know how sometimes I will just, in the moment when I'm with the guys, I'll just say something. I know it doesn't honor your name, but it's, it's guys. Come on, God. If God is convicting you and working in your heart about how you honor Him and how you love Him today, you better do some business because that's the only way to respond to this moment. You must respond with pure words and pure actions and a pure heart before God through the working of the Holy Spirit or you'll never find purity in your life. Here's my challenge for you for the next seven days. Here's the challenge. Examine your life for any idols. I spend a lot of time praying over this, and this is always the last thing I usually do in in the sermon is, what is that seven-day challenge? God, what is it that you want to speak to your people? What does somebody need to do this week? And somebody, this is a word from the Lord, somebody needs to be looking for idols in your life because you've got some. And you've become so blinded by the idols, you don't realize you've got them. So here's your challenge for the next seven days. You need to start looking for them. And you need to be asking God, where are they? Let me tell you, I've told this story before. I was doing a fast one time and I was going through this devotional and I read a devotional about idols. And I got down with this pragmatic pride. God, I ain't got no idols. This devotion didn't mean anything to me. I mean, I'm, I'm good. I love you, Lord. And then he began to tell me. And my daughter's name came to mind. That's when we only had Jayanna. It was our first child. And I dismissed it. Said, nope. She's not an idol in my life. God, if you do have an idol, if I have one, just show it to me. And he'd say, Jayanna. And I'd go, nope. Can't be her. Then it was almost like he said, if something happened to her and I took her away, how would you respond to me? And it was at that moment I began to weep because I realized my daughter had become an idol in my life. I didn't know it until I was with the Lord, but that idol was standing in the way of me and God. What idol is in your life? Spend this week trying to figure it out, but right now, whatever God is calling you to do to deal with, I want you to deal with it right now. I want you to deal with it right now. Don't wait till later this afternoon or tomorrow in your, or in your personal quiet time because if you wait to then, it ain't going to happen. So right now, everybody just close your eyes. At home, in this room, just close your eyes. And I want you to pray this prayer with me. Oh Lord, search my heart and see if there is any offensive way within me. Father, right now, deal with our hearts and our minds that, Lord, your commandments, they are not null and void. Your commandments are there to help us understand who you are, your love for us, and our need for you. God, today, may we pour our hearts and minds to you in a brand new way. May we repent of the idols that we have. May we repent of false worship, false worship of even what we call you. Because if we do not worship you as who you are, we're worshiping some other God. 
So today, Lord, work in our hearts and our minds. Today, you may have lived all of your life with the idea of, I'm going to try to be a good person. That I'm going to do things right. And maybe one day when I die, God will let me into heaven because I've been a good person. Can I tell you? I'm going to go ahead and tell you what he's going to say. He's going to say, no. You're not getting in. But pastor, I haven't done anything wrong. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't stole anything. I try not to tell lies. I, I, I do good stuff. But you're still not washed by the blood. Remember I began by Jesus fulfilled the law and gave it as a gift. If you do not receive that gift, when you stand before God, you'll have nothing to say. So today, if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, this is the moment, this is the time to deal with it and allow God to wash over you and make you new and afresh. So repeat this after me. Dear God, I have really messed up. I haven't done what you asked me to do. And I've done the things you've told me not to. So I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to take over my life. Today, if you prayed that, and God drew you to a place where you needed to pray that, you're a brand new creation. Lord, we worship you today. We worship you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.